Welcome to the first session of Reimagining Retirement, Exploring Your Life Plan. My name is Roger Baldwin. I'm the current uh, president of the Rohe Board of Directors and an emeritus professor at Michigan State University. Rohe, founded in 2002, supports all phases of faculty and staff retirement through a member network that links retired faculty and staff associations, retirement center and emeriti centers, and campus offices that engage retirees. At Arohi, we know that higher education retirees are assets of society who reinvent, not retire from life, who, and who positively impact their communities and contribute to the greater good. Over the years, we've heard from many retirees who wish that they would have had more support to assist them with the transition to retirement. For this reason, we're very excited to partner with Fidelity Investment Services to explore the issues that higher education retirees face with the transition to retirement. I hope that you will find this learning series to be valuable in your own retirement journey. Now, before we be begin, I'd like to thank and recognize Carrie Sweeney, the director of the UC Berkeley Retirement Center and also an Arohi Bard member. I wanna thank her for her vision in developing this program and her dedicated work in bringing it to fruition. We're very grateful to you, Carrie, for all of your support. Carrie will be relaying questions to our speaker at the end of the presentation. So please put your questions in the Q&A as they arise. Now I'm pleased to introduce Sasha Heathman, Fidelity Workplace Financial Consultant. Ms. Heathman promotes financial wellness for plan participants through one-on-one -on -one planning and educational events. She holds a bachelor's degree in human Devel development from the University of Texas at Austin and a master's degree in business administration from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Welcome, Sasha. Thank you so much, Roger. And it's a pleasure to be here representing Fidelity Investments and our collaboration with Arohi. Now, you may be wondering why Fidelity is interested in a learning series exploring the social, psychological, and emotional aspects of retirement. And the reality is, is that the decision to retire is both a head and a heart decision. It's through the assessment of both the quantitative and qualitative, those social, psychological, and emotional aspects that really come together to make your retirement vision a reality or reinvent your next phase of life, as Roger mentioned. My role as a workplace financial consultant is it provides me with the pleasure every day of meeting with people to help them create a plan for how to successfully prepare and transition into retirement. And it's through my conversations, specifically those within higher education, where I've learned that retirement is sometimes less of a financial decision and more about what's next. What's next for someone who has dedicated their entire career to advancing the mission of the university, connecting with and mentoring students and peers, and engaging in rewarding research, right? What's next? So if you would like help reviewing the financial aspects of your retirement or would be interested in a second opinion, please watch for a follow-up email directly from Arohi as there will be direction on how to connect with me or one of my colleagues to meet one-on-one -on -one and talk. So now for our main event, I would like to welcome Dr. Michelle Silver to join me here on our virtual stage. Dr. Silver is an associate professor at the University of Toronto and holds a cross appointments in the Dalai Lana School of Public Health and the Institute for Life Course and Aging. Her primary areas of research includes uh, work, aging, and retirement, as well as perceptions about aging and health. 
So today, Dr. Silver will explore how careful planning for later career transitions can honor one's lifelong commitments to their work. Please help me welcome Dr. Silver. Thank you so much. It's an honor to talk with you today. It is not lost on me that there are many distinguished members of this audience, and I'm really happy to be here and so happy to know about the work that Arohi does. Today, I want to talk with you about how to thrive professionally and personally as you weather the challenges life throws at you. In the popular imagination, retirement is painted as an image filled with time to relax, to withdraw or with retreat, and to disappear. I'm here to reassure you that there are many people who find this phase all but relaxing. Feeling invisible is cool if you're a superhero, but in real life, it can be incredibly disappointing. Some people find retirement can be a busy time, a time to give, to do things, to take, to take in the world, to contemplate one's legacy, and a time to reframe your identity. Now, my overall goal today is to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities associated with retirement for those whose work was or is in higher education. Now, as an academic and a chair of a department, I have some context, but today I'm primarily gonna focus on examples from people that I've interviewed about their experiences with retirement. And what I wanna point out is that life goals are moving targets. It's important not to forget that you are the driver and that we can have lots of target goals in life. And I'll set the stage here to say that I have two acts for you. In part one, I want to acknowledge that life transitions are complex. And in particular, I want to acknowledge the unique experiences for those of us who work in higher education. Within the greedy institution of academia, we're acculturated to think of our work and our personal identities as one and the same. And this can pose challenges as we think about or as we enter retirement. In part two, I wanna share some strategies for living your best life based on work I've done with people whose work and personal identities are deeply intertwined. Now, I wanna start by asking you to consider, how do you imagine spending the last few chapters of your life? I like to be in water and I live in Canada. So the idea of being in a hot tub outside where I can watch the sunset in all of my chapters is quite appealing. Now, if we lived in ancient Greece, we would have had several options for asking questions about big decisions like life transitions. And one option was to consult an oracle. And this is roughly how it would work. We would bring our question a slaughtered goat and money, and the oracle would go into a trance. And eventually, she would give you her predictions. Throughout human history, people have craved prophecy or messages about events to come. Mayan calendars, seers, Chinese oracle bones, and North mythology all illustrate how people have long wanted to find out what is going to happen next. Now, I'm not going to go into a trance. I don't hold any special powers to predict your future. My goal is to help you focus on strategies to find contentment in your retirement. Now, as I mentioned, I have two key ideas I want to focus on today. And the first is that life transitions are subjective experiences. Like art, we have different options and opinions and perspectives on them. And I want to point out that the art 
is different today than it was in the past. We are living longer now than we have ever before. Role expectations for women and for men and for each of us as academics and academic staff are very different today. Retirement expectations and the implications of retirement have changed dramatically in our lifetimes. And thus, we must regularly reinterpret and strategize. I like to think of life transitions like art because the interpretation is in the eyes of the beholder. It's important that we take the time to step back and interpret what's going on. Because as I mentioned, things are very different now. Your family and your professional experiences are different from that of your parents and the role models who influenced you and you were, and influenced your underlying impressions of adulthood. I will remind you that we're living longer. I'm going to remind you of that quite a bit. And that means that you, for one, had better take extra good care of your teeth. So I'm going to be taking this opportunity to remind you to keep taking care of your bodies and also be generous to yourself and those around you. Economize. Think about planning for your retirement like you would plan for a job, like you have planned for jobs in the past. And be nice to yourself and practice living like you're living your best life. Now, as I mentioned, I want to belabor this point that on average, more of us are living longer now than we have in all of human history. For most of human history, life expectancy has been under 40 years old. Now, life expectancy in North America is well over 80 years old. So in less than 200 years, we have more than doubled our life expectancy. So on this slide, you can see we have life expectancy over time by continent with life expectancy on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Life expectancy has increased dramatically all around the world since around the Industrial Revolution. Now, there is some variation by continent and country, and we could talk a lot more about that, but the point I want to make is that by and large across every continent, more of us are living longer. So you see, we are living in remarkable times, and this has implications for every aspect of life and society. Living longer has implications for the ways that we structure our working lives. When the first universal pension plans were introduced around the 1950s for workers in Europe and in North America, they tended to be offered for those who were 70 years old and over. Now, note that in most of these regions, workers in the 1950s had a life expectancy of no more than 65, and most workers were men. So original pension plans were designed to kick in when the average worker was already dead. Now, fast forward to time to leading into the 1970s, and now the average man can live, expect to live about 15 additional years after he retires. And for women, it's more like 20 years. Now, that's a lot of time to sit on the beach or take cruises, and it's also potentially an expensive time. Now, another point to consider is that in contrast to men, women have tended to have different work experiences. Women are more likely to work part-time, to take time off for caregiving at all stages in life, to receive a lower income, and to receive a lower pension relative to men if they have a pension at all. And yet on average, women live longer than men in nearly every country on the planet. Around the world, there are a wide range of ways that people experience retirement. And that's why it's important 
not to get locked into certain models that you observed in the past. And I'm going to share some examples with you shortly of individuals who struggled with their retirement choices so that we can think more about how to avoid pitfalls and how to focus on living our best lives. But first, I want to say just a little bit more about the all-consuming world of higher education, which is to say that academia can be a greedy institution. Prominent sociologist Louis Poser described greedy institutions as those that require total commitment from their members, thus enabling the prioritization of institutional demands over participation in other non-work spheres. Greedy institutions demand undivided time, attention, and loyalty. This can mean working on weekends, at night, anytime, anywhere. Sound familiar? Now, the popular perception of academia often leaves something to be desired. We are seen as absent-minded and dismissive of our duties to others. Many of us, including those on staff and in administrative positions, will recognize that there's some truth to this. But it's also the case that an academic's work and those of us working in higher education as staff in all the roles that we fill, this requires full commitment, focus, and often self-sacrifice. And this can exacerbate intergenerational tensions, complicate our planning for retirement, and make traditional talks about work-life balance feel a bit unrealistic. Among academics, retirement can be seen as roleless and disorienting. As academics, we often spend our lives committed to a singular focus, contributing new knowledge or communicating to new communities or to institution building. And then at precisely the right moment, we're expected to know when to make our major career transitions. And if we don't get that timing right, we're viewed as a drain on resources. After an adulthood, that has been largely dedicated to getting into academia and to focusing on our work, the concept of life transitions and retirement can be a complex endeavor. So cartoons are one form of life and not everyone likes the art. And I wanna remind you about how life transitions are like art. They're subjective. Sometimes when I use the word retirement, People tell me that they hate the word. They associate it with boredom, laziness, fear, and death. Other people can't wait to retire. They love everything about the idea of it. And there are some people who tell me that retirement is a really fuzzy concept. It's very blurry, very abstract. Now, in 2018, I wrote a book called Retirement and Its Discontents, where I observed that retirement can be filled with discontentment, particularly among people whose personal identity was deeply intertwined with their professional identity. I conducted hundreds of interviews with the goal of better understanding the social meaning of retirement in the hopes of learning how to better prepare for life transitions. And since then, I've been working on two projects. One is focused on aging with agility, and another focuses on the habits of highly effective retired people. And for both, I've been interviewing people about what it means to live your best life in retirement. Because each chapter in life requires initiative and preparation, I want to share some strategies based on examples from people that I've interviewed from some of those projects today. So this brings us to part two, and these are the strategies that I'm going to discuss for shaping the art that is life transitions and for learning how to live our best lives. 
Now, you'll note that some of what I'm going to share will be models of what can be a good strategy, and others are going to highlight pitfalls. So the first strategy that I want to talk about is financial planning. And you won't be surprised to hear that one takeaway is that financial planning needs to start early and be revisited often. The next is to declutter, not just your house, but all aspects of your life. And then I'll talk about practice and how this is not just something that we need to do as kids. Practicing is something that we must develop, we must do to develop skills and habits at any point in life. And finally, I'll talk about staying active and not just physically. First, it's important to make the very basic point that's always worth restating, which is that preparation is half the battle and financial planning is necessary. But I'm not going to get into investment strategies. Luckily, you have Sasha and Fidelity for that. Instead, I'm going to share a quick warning story, and then I'm going to focus on how financial planning is about being generous. Unfortunately, I've heard many stories of well-paid professionals who couldn't afford to retire when they wanted to, and even of physicians who took donations from their patients in order to retire. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about Alan. Alan told me very early on when we started interviewing that in his retirement, he often asked the question, if you're finished being a doctor, what is your value? His work often required quick decision making. It was all consuming. And at a certain point, it became more effective for Alan to simply stay in his persona as a doctor all the time instead of switching to another role, like father or husband once he came home. Now, Alan married twice and he had five children, two in his first marriage and three in his second. And over the years, he had bankrolled private school tuition, music lessons, ski trips, orthodontist visits, college tuition, weddings, and house down payments for his two oldest children. He wanted to be able to do these things for his younger children as well. Alan claimed that his financial obligations prevented him from preparing for right retirement financially, and his drive to stay focused at work kept him from planning for retirement mentally. He never created the time or the mental space to create a financial safety net for himself. He had always given more than 100% to his work, and he admitted to generally being unavailable for his family, except as a provider. In my quest to find what helps people find their best life, particularly in retirement, I've been told that the feeling of being generous is one of the greatest sources of satisfaction a person can have. It's important to take the time to create a financial safety net for yourself so that when life transitions arise, you can then be generous with yourself by giving yourself the time and the space to strategize and to adjust. So you might find that you want to take up a new hobby or learn a new skill. My husband and I just started curling, and it's not a fancy sport, but it's also not cheap. You might decide that it's important to leave a financial legacy to your children, to your relatives, or to your university. Your legacy might be volunteering to help others learn how to read. You might decide that you want to be generous right now. And several people have told me that they want to give to their children or offspring while they're still alive, not when they're dead. Being generous with your skills and your time requires that you feel comfortable to give your time. So each of the strategies that I'm going to speak about next will speak to finding ways that you can feel more comfortable 
allocating your time in the way that you want. So the next strategy I want to discuss is to declutter. And again, this is not just about your home or your desk. This is about applying the skills that you've developed throughout your life and throughout your work life to focus on what brings you joy. Now, we've all heard the stories of the hoarders who end up unable to get through the front door because there's so much stuff in the way. And some of you may have ha even had the challenging experience of moving a parent or a loved one who accumulated some extra baggage. Now, I'm not going to give you a Marie Kondo lesson in how to fold, but I will echo her advice of simplifying, organizing, and asking what sparks joy. These ideas are important, not just to the rooms in your house. They're also relevant to finances and personal relationships and other aspects of life. Now, Wendy had always derived a strong sense of self-worth from her work. From my first interview with Wendy, it was clear that she had always loved her work, but it had demanded everything of her until there was nothing left for it to take. Wendy had a successful career working in higher education, she also raised four children and maintained an insatiable sense of curiosity. Her rigorous schedule suited her well. However, the greedy institution of academia was all consuming. And Wendy found that her work was far more than just a job. In her retirement, Re Wendy struggled to remember her life before she had started working. And I want to share one aspect of what Wendy did to recalibrate her sense of self. And it relates to decluttering. Wendy and others that I've interviewed have used an important strategy, which is to apply what you do or what you did well at work to create the retirement that helps you live your best life. Now, this is not about being less busy. And this is not only about cleaning out those drawers. Wendy had some obligations that she claimed that she came to realize were not as fulfilling. And so she let go of them. She readjusted her priorities and her daily tasks to align them with new interests. She applied the attention to detail that made her successful in her earlier career to get rid of some of the clutter in her life, to regain a sense of control, and to focus on what mattered most to her. So she reorganized her approach to each day. It's important to remember that a day is a natural measure of time. The earth rotates one complete rotation on its axis about 24 hours, or in approximately 24 hours. But even that's an estimation, right? The rotation's more like 23 hours and 56 minutes. And from there, there's minutes and there's seconds and there's milliseconds used in sports. But these are much less natural measures of time. It's important that you find ways of using your time to your own advantage. And I want to share some of the work of Dr. Laura Carsonson, who some of you may know, Dr. Carsonson is an esteemed professor at Stanford who's put together a meaningful and well-regarded, the meaningful and well-regarded socio-emotional socio selectivity theory, which suggests that as people's time horizons shrink, as it does with age, people become increasingly selective about what they choose to focus on. They optimize their time and emotional energy by investing in their, by investing their resources in emotionally meaningful goals and activities. Aging is thus associated with a preference for positive over negative information. And with age, people optimally, selectively narrow their social interactions 
to maximize positive emotional experiences and minimize emotional risks. So the strategy is instead of getting bogged down in clutter and chaos, let us focus on contributions that spark joy. Don't rob yourself of taking the time to invest in what you need to do to be independent. Don't let things pile up or put off relationships or interests that help you live your best life. Some people have told me that joining a choir has been the key to happiness in their retirement. I recently rediscovered an old hobby of painting after years of irrationally thinking that if I had a personal hobby, it might somehow throw off my focus on work. These hobbies help us become more effective in all aspects of our work, and they help us learn what we like. I've interviewed many people who've told me that it's no fun to play golf if you feel like you're not good at it, particularly if you're used to being really good at what you do. So the key is stop putting off learning what it is that you like and start practicing to get good at it. So the third strategy is to practice. When we go through big life transitions, we must remember that practicing is not just something that we do as kids. Practicing is something that we must do to develop skills and habits at any point in life. Elite athletes know better than anyone about the importance of practicing. They must possess incredible physical and mental energy as well as the ability to focus and to practice in order to achieve their goals. In some of my research, I examine the experiences of elite athletes to illustrate how their focus on singular goals comes at the cost of developing a well-rounded self. And I describe how the all-consuming process of rising to great heights in sport can create very low points when it comes to making a professional transition. Allison started training when she was four. She trained eight hours a day, six days a week. Her career as an Olympic gymnast left her body racked with pain. And when she retired, she had to adapt to the loss of companionship and community as she adjusted to retirement's autonomy and independence. For many people, a major life transition can mean losing your connection to a community that you immersed yourself in nearly every day. Allison lost her sense of purpose when she retired. And what helped her was practicing something new. It took everything in her, but eventually Allison recalibrated her sense of self by rechanneling her energy into a new line of work as a paramedic. It wasn't glamorous or high paying. And in the recent pandemic, it really retested her ability to overcome anxieties and to remain focused. But it also connected her to a bigger picture and to a new set of goals. The athletes that I've interviewed have amazing stories of pain and resilience, big highs and big lows, perseverance and erratic stops and starts. And I wanna share one more athlete's experience with you today, and that's Omar's story. Unlike Allison, who I interviewed when she was in her early 20s, Omar was in his mid seventies when we first met. And Omar had an amazing career as a runner and as an academic and as an academic administrator. He retired from many different positions and roles in life. And he described each as a phase of uncertainty. He emphasized the idea of practicing to be effective in each role that he took on as a strategy which can help make later career transitions smoother and as something that we must do in order to adapt to new roles, in order to get comfortable, in order to get good.
Omar also emphasized the importance of staying active in multiple ways. And this can mean figuring out how to rechannel your energy into new productive outlets. So plan for your retirement and live in your retirement as if you're planning and living in a new job. You can see there are several books that I recommend here about later life transitions. And reading up is one way of planning and practicing to figure out and also do the things that bring you joy is another. For many people who reach the top of their field, it can be hard to imagine life without work. But retirement is much better when it's a choice. The point here is to find new ways of engaging and then practice the habit of staying active. And this brings us to my final strategy. And I'm not just talking about staying active in order to maintain body function. Many people have told me about the importance of treating your body like a temple. And yes, let's reinforce that. But I'm also talking about staying active mentally and generally keeping engaged in the ways that bring you joy. And I want to give you a few more examples on this note. So at Robert's retirement party, he heard story after story commending him for the hundreds of papers that he had written and the countless students he had worked with. But he told me that his retirement party felt more like a funeral. He was not done yet. So he decided to focus on his writing. Now, to say that Robert was unhappy with his retirement would be misleading. In his retirement, Robert was able to focus on aspects of his career that he found most rewarding. In his retirement, he stayed active, working on what he considered to be his most important life's work. He identified his priorities. He focused on what he wanted his legacy to be. He economized and he was generous to himself. Now, my last example today is Claire. Claire had worked since the time she was 14 years old. She rose through the ranks to become the CEO of a hospital. And that was no small accomplishment. However, within a few years of becoming a CEO, she developed cancer and within a day, of announcing her diagnosis to her full board, her staff contacted her about the assembly of her retirement package. At one point, Claire told me she wasn't sure whether she had been more challenged by retirement or by her battle with cancer. Now, when I last met Claire, it was in her office where she worked as an executive vice president. And she explained that she was now doing some of the most fulfilling and gratifying work of her life. Now, there are many famous innovators and individuals whose most significant contributions to society have come later in life. It is not difficult to list more examples of major contributions made by people who were in later stages of the life course. You might recognize a few on the slide here and probably have many, many others um, that you could share. And this raises questions about the associations that we have with age and work or between age and productivity or even purpose in life. As baby boomers are embracing traditional retirement age, organizations are at risk of a massive brain drain and loss of intellectual capacity and loss of institutional memory. Now, more of us are more likely to make it into later stages of adulthood. 
in the past 200 years, in many parts of the world, life expectancy has doubled. The National Institute of Aging estimates that people living in economically developed regions have added approximately three months to their life for each year that transpired during the last century. So that today, nearly 15% of the population in North America is over 65, and 20% of the population in countries like Japan, Germany, and Italy are 65 and over. These numbers are growing, and consider that just two centuries ago, less than 2% of the population was over 65. Having more people living longer means that we have to rethink our understandings of the relationship between work and age. Ageism still pervades much of the workforce. We all need to recognize this threat and creatively rethink strategies to create more sensitive and sophisticated ways to capture mature workers' knowledge and to retain mature workers to the extent that the interest in continuing to work is mutual. Now, there are a number of books out there that I recommend for people looking at later career transitions and employment, and you can see a few that are featured here. There are also numerous podcasts about retirement and life transitions. I've had the pleasure to be a guest on several. These podcasts can be a valuable resource for people who are interested in learning more about the non-financial aspects of retirement, and of course, there's no shortage of blogs and popular retirement influencers out there. Many people are finding multiple ways of sharing their experiences, their recipes, their work tips, and a wealth of ideas about later life transitions. I want to remind us that it's important to consider that some people are eager to retire. And in that case, there's a host of decisions to make regarding finances and decluttering and practicing and finding ways to be active. And also, I want you to consider that these concepts also apply to people who want to keep working. Experienced workers have important skills that are often overlooked. Don't assume that you'll want to be done by an arbitrary chronological age. Some people are not eager or ready to have a traditional retirement, whatever that means. Others simply just don't want to see it as a binary decision. At the start, I asked, how would you imagine spending the last few chapters of your life? Now consider the idea that the next few chapters could be filled with spaces for us to advocate for, to elevate, and to celebrate one another. It could be a time to invest time and resources in personal retirement saving strategies and career transitions at all stages of life. It could be a time and place where we respect our planet and we're also sustainable with our bodies and in our working lives. It could be a time and place where exercise and healthy movement are built into our work so that we're healthy enough to work in whatever way we want to be working for as long as we want. So now we live in remarkable times because numbers are taking on new meaning. 50s, the new 30, 70s, the new 50, 90s, the new awesome. Many of us still live with the expectation that hitting a specific chronological age is telling of all sorts of things, like how productive you are or what your creative potential is. I believe that we are missing out on a subset of society who wants to keep contributing or who want to pivot and contribute in new ways 
because we're being governed by anachronistic norms and ageist assumptions. I think it's important not to dismiss or disregard people because they reach a specific chronological age. And I believe it's important that as a society, we provide greater assistance for people whose health has declined to a point that working doesn't work. Now, it would be great to have an oracle to advise us on our optimal path, particularly during uncertain times. But remember that in adulthood, your chronological age is not really telling of much beyond when your next birthday is going to occur. And be mindful that aging today is different from the past. Today, you can be your own oracle. I want to thank you so much for your time today. I'll leave you with this question, which is if you knew that you had 100 years, how would you design them? And now I'm going to turn it over to the fantastic Carrie Sweeney, who's going to lead our Q&A. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, so many good thoughts and so many great insights um, that you've given us today. And we have a lot of questions coming in, so I'll get right to them. If you're on YouTube, it's a little bit delayed. So I'll ask one of the questions there. Could you send us a list of the books recommended? Um, could you, well, well, yes, we'll send you those slides that are on the recording that have the list of the books there. Okay, because your slides- And are the last slide I didn't show you has got the references, so- Oh, perfect. So it's okay. in there. Um, how do you, Caroline Kane asks, how do you suggest we encourage friends disappointed by or even depressed by retirement? I love retirement. Sure, sure. I mean, I would start by, by saying that those particular friends are not alone, even if you can't relate, um, that, that it is, it is not unusual. Um, you, you could, send them my book. <laughs> that'll, that'll give them a sense. But you could also suggest and, and be patient with them. Um, but, you know, maybe suggest some new things that you can try together. Um, obviously, something's working for you, right? And, you know, given uh, I'm going to assume you were an academic or that your work was in academia, and I'm imagining that you maybe your friends have different work backgrounds or different life experiences. And I and and while I do think that um, you know that there's we're not a homogeneous group, I do think there's certain advantages that we have as academics because we have been in an autonomous type of role where you know we had to plan syllabi and we had to you know make over the course of our careers decisions about whether to you know focus on writing or focus and put our energy in teaching or focus on being a public intellectual or um, or whatnot, and or becoming an administrator. And I think that those sort of career options that we have, even though they often feel like they're forced upon us or not coming at a time that we're prepared for them, they give us a sort of unique insight into what it's like to make decisions about or what it's like to adjust to to different types of, of roles and different and to live in different types of identities. So I would say be patient with this friend. It's very possible for these friends that their work and life experiences were different, that they didn't have the opportunity to try out different identities earlier on. Um, and they may very well have struggled with trend or, you know, maybe they had lots of transitions, but they struggled with those as well, right? Um, there's, there's several theoretical frameworks that we can apply to think about, to think about that and to think about, you know, how do we adapt to life transitions? Sometimes we adapt the way we always have, um, because we're not good at, at that. So I don't know. I mean, I guess if it was a friend of mine, I would, I would think about, um, starting up a new activity and, um, and and seeing if they might want to join it with you, you know, could be a going for walks, could be a art class. I'd need to know more about um, <laughs> what the friends' pos range of possibilities are. Um, maybe it means just you know having a movie night together 
and um and just thinking about enjoying each other's company Hacking on to that is the idea that this is all based on the individual. Um, can you speak to the issues in a couple where one is considering retiring and one does not want to retire? Do you have any experience or insight on the situation, not necessarily negotiating decisions, but developing workable life structure? Maybe this will be addressed in a later session, but uh, go for it. Oh, terrific. Well, I know there's great sessions coming up, um, but I will say that. Um, in the book, I've got a chapter about an academic couple that had the experience where, um, in this particular case, the husband was ready to retire, the wife's career was just getting going, and the idea of <laughs> stopping was incredibly um, disheartening. And um, and I think this is not uncommon, although I think there's many different ways that partners experience um, differences in terms of their transitions. Here, I would think about how you negotiated earlier differences in terms of life transitions. They don't always happen at the same time. Quite often, especially if there's kids involved, there's different timings, right? There's, there's you know, one parent, often it's the mother, will, will take the time and, and, um, and it'll interfere with the career trajectory. And then there's time when, um, you know, careers go at different stages. And so retirement is, a, is another stage that um, can be really complicated when you're not perfectly in sync. Um, so, uh, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've heard like, oh my gosh, my retirement would be great if so, you know, if he would just keep working or if she would just not be in the same space, right? Now the pandemic gave us a little bit of insight for those who, you know, weren't retired prior to, um, it gave us a little bit of insight as to what it was like to share space together. And um, I don't want to remind, I don't need to remind us of that time, but but I will say that it, it, it put a lot of people into retirement. Um, and a lot of people found that, you know, while they love their partner, they don't love spending time with them 24 seven. So, um, I did a study where I interviewed homemakers and, um, and there, you know, they were, um, experiencing retirement when their partners retired largely. And there, that was a real complaint, like stay out of my space because I'm really used to that space. There's lots of different ways that we can take lessons from that and um, and recognize that um, we need to work on it like we would a job. We need to think, you know, my advice would be think about how you would deal with a coworker or a colleague that um, was trying to I don't know, get away with a schedule that wasn't conducive to your own or trying to push you into a role that you weren't ready to be in. And think about how you would strategize around that if it was coming from your chair or coming from your dean or your um or someone who was trying to impose a structure on you that way. And um and think about, you know, what kind of, there, there's a whole host of strategies we could map out there, right? For thinking about how to negotiate your time, their time, um, you know, and how to compromise, right? Like maybe it's about taking trips together and and there's ways to do that. Um, oh, I'd love to get into like the specifics <laughs> of who wanted to do what and how. Um, but I, I, I think that um, it, it would be, you know, I, I think I'll leave you with that. Like, think about the strategies you would come up with if this was a work situation where you had different schedules and or were pu being pushed into a role you weren't ready for yet. Mm. Thank you. Um, thank you, Michelle. This is a question similar, though. How do we account for gradual loss of mental acumen? So this sort of once again, loss, talking about the loss of um, things in retirement, so mental acumen, how should we account for it? Sure. So, right. So, I mean, our brain is like a muscle, you know, we, we, uh, it, it is natural for us to atrophy with age. There is a very wide range of ways that we experience aging. And um, there's a very wide range that mental decline uh, encroaches on all of us. Um, you know, like if you think about the trajectories that we go through early in the life course, right? Like how 
how quickly our brains develop and but that they start not so um not so skilled you know it it sort of makes more sense and it sounds less ageist to acknowledge that our brains change over time right they incredit they they you know there's a lot of things that you can you know that I can do at this stage in life that a very young toddler just can't right even though i might not be all that quick and and um and the mental at, you know, remembering <laughs> exactly where I put my cup of coffee. And um, so I make another one. And, um, and I think that that it's important that we be generous with ourselves, be generous with those in our lives, who are, you know, experiencing um, those mental changes, and the cognitive changes. And also remember that, you know, our neural pathways are constantly changing, right? So, it's, it is, you know, there's lots of research. There's probably many of you in the audience who, um, who can, who can cite or who have contributed to this work, um, which recognizes that, you know, we, we create new neural pathways all the time that um, there's a, a whole lot of benefit to the experience that we accumulate later in life that helps us compensate for some of the natural or or you know um, illness and um, degenerative changes that take place, so I would say, like recognize that there there are physiological changes that happen. We, some of us, it's easier for us to see it in ourselves. Some of us, it's easier for us to see it in others. But it it, it does happen. It doesn't happen the same just because you know you're parent had dementia, my father had dementia, that doesn't necessarily mean that I will, right? Um, that's true. Um, but it it does mean that, you know, there, there are changes that will happen if I'm lucky enough to live long enough. So, um, so I would say, you know, practicing is a is an important way to keep the skills or to develop skills that you need to maintain those neural pathways and to keep that muscle strong. Um, so, you know, consider that, consider that. And don't be worried about having post-it notes everywhere or notes all over <laughs> because that's lots of us live that way. Um, I hope that's helpful and and um, related to what the question was. It's a complicated question and I, I wanted to be careful. I hope I was careful in my answer there. Um, but I would say be patient, be generous with yourself. And, and practice if you're finding that there are limitations um, that are coming with, with the decline that for most of us is, is quite natural. Of course, there's exceptions. Of course, there are people who are, you know, don't, don't decline, but, but that's, you know, that's lucky for them. Mm -hmm. I thought you answered that very nicely. There's a couple of other questions related to that adapting issue. Um, one, I want to read it because I think it's really Nice. I retired about 10 years ago and I enjoyed volunteering, skating, swimming, book clubs, writing, knitting. I would love to travel, but I'm a caretaker for my husband with dementia, with physical issues. I try to have as much fun as possible despite disabilities. And that similarly uh, person asked about how do you balance, um, Charles Brown uh, said, how do you balance when a spouse has a different rate of decline? Right, right. Well, First, I want to commend you. Um, being a caretaker is probably the hardest work that there is. And um, and it sounds like you're being incredibly generous um, with your time. And that there are probably ways that you could be more generous to yourself. Um, so, you know, again, without knowing the specifics, I would suggest that you find ways that you can... Um, share some of that generosity that you are giving as a caretaker and that I, I have a feeling you've probably done throughout your life to be more generous with yourself and think about, you know, I, I heard you, I heard that you, you're volunteering and you're skating and you, and that there are many activities that bring you joy in life. And I would say, just let me give you the prescription <laughs> I, 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 that says, um, that you need to keep doing that, that you cannot let go of that. Just like the, you know, early career academic that thinks that they, you know, can't um, have an outside interest. 
um, you need to have, you need to hold on to those outside interests and keep practicing them. That's your prescription um, is to hold on to that as well. And um, and I, I commend you for that work that you're doing as a caregiver. Again, that is no joke. Thank you. Um, this goes back to ageism and uh, we got it from someone on the YouTube chat. Um, any advice on how to respond to the aren't you bored in retirement, bored in all caps, questions from our non-retired friends and colleagues? And I say ageism because I think that makes a large assumption about what, <laughs> what retirement is if they're assuming aren't you bored. So what would you give as advice on how to respond to that comment that someone makes? Oh, when someone says to you, are you bored? Yeah, oh. aren't, you, aren't you bored in retirement? Oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> I mean, I would say, remember that thick skin that got you through tenure, or got you through the job and, it, you know, that got you through working at the university, putting up with all the the other um, fancy academics. You know, I think that, um, you know, I, I wouldn't put too much weight on that. You know, I mean, some people, people who find things boring are probably boring people. You know, I think that you, you've, you no, I think retirement is living your best life. And I think they're probably just missing out on that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't put too much weight on that uh, mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know them, but you know. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, I mean, the one who said, are you bored? Right, right, right. We're assuming they're not on this one, or they've never met a retiree before. <laughs> yes, most of them are not very bored. Um, no, I think most are not. No, uh, it's a matter of saying no to some things more than others. Um, saying yes can be um, saying no can be hard in in retirement. Um, yeah, I mean, I just I don't think it's such a nice thing to say. You know, I don't. I so I don't. I don't know the context of it, but I just think. They, they're they're not there yet or they're you know they've put so much in their work identity mm -hmm. that they don't recognize how much of life there is you know that you can carry on um while you carry that title of of being retired I mean some people tell me they hate they love their life but they hate the word retirement they just don't want to be identified that way even though like what they're doing is you know anyway it's it's a it's a tricky word I mean in my, in my book I have like a definitional page of all the ways retirement is defined and it's like bizarre it's like it means all these different things and then you look at the academic literature in economics and whatnot and it's like the word is is a very ambiguous word really yeah uh, and it and it's less relevant um of a scripture than uh, what we're seeing today um, and what we're trying to communicate to people looking to retire is to give them a better sense of um, where their path may go. And the challenge is too, is uh, you mentioned it earlier, is making these opportunities for people when they retire. Is the, We need a there there, more opportunities like the what is said in the Encore books and the other points that you made. Michelle, I've got lots of questions. Um, how, let's see, I love retirement too. I appreciate your point of decluttering. One big issue my husband and I run into, this is from Tia, Thea, I run into is how little respect the medical community has for our time and how time inefficient it can be, it is to be a patient seeking wellness. All the waiting and fragmented appointments dings my joy in retirement. <laughs> is there any solution to this? That sounds like a whole nother <laughs> Oh, another lecture about uh, the efficiencies of medical care. Yeah, no, it's no party um, <laughs> trying to figure out how to navigate the medical system. And then, um, it's, I mean, I'm trying to think like, you know, bring a good book, bring your knitting, <laughs> bring your phone with some movies downloaded. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, yes, this is a bigger policy question is how time is allocated um, and and just the way people are triaged um, within the medical system. It's, it, it, is, it is difficult. Um, I'm glad you appreciate the point about decluttering. There's probably a bit of decluttering that could happen within, within medicine to be more efficient um, with communicating our records. And, um, you know, for many of us, as we age, our, our medical conditions become more complica complicated, right? We have more um, multiple morbidities and more to manage and more, and that means more appointments and more communication. Um, and so, 
you know, so there, like, it's really important that we sort of declutter whatever was our health issue, like, you know, two years ago or whatever medications we were taking then, like, it's really important to declutter the medicine cabinet, keep reassessing, keep checking in, making sure that um, we're being careful with the combinations of medicines that one is taking is incredibly important. So I'm really glad that you, at first I wasn't sure how to address this question, but now that I think about it, it's a really important connection to make is decluttering you know, the ways that you approach your own medical treatments, if you're, you know, if you, if that's, uh, that can be a very big part of your life or your partner's life or, you know, or maybe a, um, a parent or an aunt or, or even a child that you're caregiving for. If you've got that all cluttered up, then that can just be incredibly time consuming, mentally exhausting. And so, you know, I would say like, if you take nothing else away, like clean out the medicine cabinet, go through the list of like what, what your, your needs and your family's needs are in that way. Um, because, you know, that's complicated stuff and it's very much worth, you know, finding, uh, so that you can find joy is very much worth kind of going through what, what you've got going on, um, in, at the medical appointments, having your records ready, right? So that when you go in, you can advocate for yourself. Thank you. Um, we have many people here that are, of course, already retired, and some of them have been making comments. Are there best practices for institutions to, oh, I read that completely wrong. Well, it's just, are there best practices for institutions to assist retired faculty? So I'm guessing they mean um, they're already retired and um, ways to support or assist it for, um, retired faculty, so. Well, sure. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, it depends on the institution, right? So, like, sometimes I talk with medical, with, you know, um, physicians, and there's a whole set of ways that their pensions are very different, and there's ways that they need to think about um, structuring that there are you know, rules that don't allow them to like timeshare and sort of transition slowly within academia. I think we have a lot more options. Um, they're not tons, but they're growing. Right. And so um, I think when we're thinking about like leading into retirement, there are things like practicing being retired. So that might mean gradually retiring or, you know, doing like a um, some universities offer uh, like 75, 50, 25 transition. Um, I would say also consider that on the back end as well. Like if you're, if you're through retirement, you know, you're through the process, you're officially retired, but you, um, your institution didn't offer that or whatever, consider being gradual with yourself and not trying to do a cold turkey retirement. So if you're pre-retirement practice, like practice what it's like to just have time that is incredibly unstructured. Once you've come through, I would say a best practice is giving yourself some structure so that, you know, sort of on this on this other end, you have a sense of what your goals and priorities are in a way that's very similar to the way you thought about your time while you were working. So where it would have been like, you know, office hours, lecture prep, whatever, faculty meetings, whatever, or like, you know, staff, staff meetings, you know, um, you know, planning for the recruitment event, you know, blocks of time in that way. Think about it on the other end, at least initially, so that you're structuring, you're keeping a calendar, if that's what you did. Some people it's online, some people it's on paper. I like old fashioned paper. Um, calendar that that plots out what you're going to do because otherwise like one of the um individuals that I interviewed said you know every day becomes like a Saturday Sunday is like Saturday Sunday it just keeps repeating there's no more Monday there's no difference between Monday Friday and if you don't plan it out and structure it then you know things can become very ambiguous and unless that's your goal is to just have completely unstructured time it can be really disconcerting to jump into a time, it can feel very lonely. And, it, you know, I, I wonder if maybe even the first person who asked a question here, you know, maybe that's that could be some of the issue with their friends as well, that, you know, there isn't any structure 
So, you know, it really matters like what sort of um, shape you're in physically and um, cognitively, but working within the parameters that are available to you, practicing keeping a schedule, whether that means reading and, you know, getting together with this or that person or finding new things going on, going to the art museum, going, you know, to hear a continuing education lecture, um, you know, volunteering at the choir or, or to help um, others learn to read, whatnot. You know, there's no shortage of things to do. The, the issue I think we run into is, you know, how to structure our time so that it is most conducive to what it means to live our own best life. So, you know, some people exercising in the morning is essential. If they don't do it, then they're too tired late at night, right? And so one of the projects that I'm working on, the Aging with Agility project, I talked with folks about that. Like, you know, what does it mean to, you know, get the most physically out of out of your body that you, whatever kind of body it is, whatever's left that's still working, right? And some people said, you know, forget it, like later in the day, that's when I'm warmed up. I'm less likely to get injured. That's the time to do it. And so it's different for each person, right? And maybe being physical is not a priority. I would suggest it should be for all of us, just like making movement however we can um, so that we can have options later to keep moving. Um, so, that, you know, that's, that's one way to think about it. Um, you know, another best practice I would say is like really figuring out what it is that you enjoy and don't be intimidated if you're not great at it right away or if your body has changed so that you're not moving in the way that you did before so you know you might not be as graceful of a um skier um <laughs> that you were earlier in life but um you know it, but that's also your body is different it's configured differently and it's changed and so you know finding ways of you know be cross country skiing or other ways other types of activities are are the way to go i would say that's a best practice right is figuring out what you like and figuring out how that fits with who you are now and maybe that's going to mean finding a new a new way and can i just say like for those of you who are really living your best life. Um, I'd love to talk with you because I do have some ongoing projects um, that I, I, you know, I would really love to be able to um, continue. And I know this is a great audience. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to put that out there. Make sure to put your contact information and in, there's an email following this event. Uh, we can include it there uh, or you can email us at um, info at arohi.org to ask any of the about uh, contact info for Michelle. Um, Maybe I can share one of my product, one of my um, ethic protocols, yeah, and we can see if folks wanna. Okay, wanna that'd be great. They have to do that. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, that's someone sound that sounds that idiotic, but I do. Re how do I recognize when I'm within my best life? And I, I think it sounds like checking in with yourself and making sure that something, whatever you're want or doing, is matching where you're at right now. Um, would you like to comment further of when recognizing you're within your best life? I think you did touch on that just now. I would say you're on track. Like if you're questioning it, I bet you're, I bet you're just about there or you're there because I think, I think the point is really to question it, to think about it, like to give, to be generous with yourself so that you are saying, am I living my best life or am I just kind of doing what everybody else expects me to do? Or am I just doing what I think is what is expected of me? Or I somehow think that this is going to be the legacy that I want people to remember me as. And, you know, the truth of the matter is they're not going to remember you the way whatever this legacy you have painted in your mind is. They're going to remember you however they decide that they you know whatever their biases are you know they'd be like oh yeah that was the one who like worked all the time and like wrote you know seven gazillion this or that you know but was kind of you know not anyway you know they, like it could be totally lost on on uh, others right and so I would say like thinking about am I living my best life is this is this what I what I want to be doing with the time that I have left um and then I think you're on track if that's what you're asking. 
we have to wrap up, but I want to ask there's two or three people who have asked when when should you start planning for retirement? Some people get that asked as a retiree. Some people are not quite sure. Can you answer that in a quick uh, yeah. response? Now, yeah, now, like you should start now. There's yeah. never a time that is too soon. I'm sure Sasha would agree with me. Yeah. There is never a time that is too soon uh, to start thinking about it. Right. Just like the, just like your finances are going to compound, right? Like the interest is going to compound if you invest early. The same thing is true for, um, you know, for the, the activities that you might enjoy, like, you know, start practicing them now, you know, you've, you, you've made it to be in a rohi or associate of a rohi or someone considering it, then that means you've made it. Like you don't, you, you need to start thinking about, the whole picture. And even if you never do this retirement plan, at least you've thought about it. So it's not so scary. And so you've got, or or you, you've got a goal that you're working towards. So anyway, yeah, short answer is now. Yeah. Now it's good. Thank you, Michelle. You, you have gotten some fabulous comments. I have um, have time to share them, but I um, just that how great this has been, how they could have used this earlier, um, how helpful we had. A, um, uh, we'll be able to put those questions down. You're getting lots of hearts and thumbs up, and we will share those questions with you just so you can see. And I want to turn it back over to Roger now, um, um, who will close us out and tell us about the rest of the series. Thank you so much, Michelle. I learned a lot and your answers are um, ones that I'll hold on to to use. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so I, I see lots of uh, applause and, and hearts floating across my screen. So I think that's a very good sign. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Silver for her enlightening and encouraging presentation. Uh, Fidelity Retirement Services for their valuable support and for all of you for attending today's session. Uh, please join us uh, for session two on Tuesday, February 13th, when Dr. Stacy Gordon from New York University will lead participants through the process of identifying values and goals in retirement. We will, we will be sending you an email uh, with a link to an evaluation for today's session. Uh, I encourage you to complete the evaluation as your feedback will help us to shape uh, future Arohi events. Uh, and finally, I would just like to wish everyone who participated today uh, a great day is, uh, with the, the rest of your day and indeed a fulfilling retirement. So best to everyone.